I'm Dan Handley. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer for the Clinical and Translational Genome Research Institute in Florida. Um, our interest is really in accelerating um, the adoption of uh, genomic medicine and, um, and accelerating medical progress. Because we see a lot of academic um, centers that you get into this routine where you publish and publish and publish and what you're discovering doesn't get translated in the clinic. So what we're trying to do is accelerate innovation into clinical practice. What I'd like to do today, actually, is to, is one objective for me, and that is to change your thinking and maybe right or wrong in the history of science of how we've thought about the human body. So this is titled, The Ecosystem Within. So what I'm going to ask these questions, you know, broad questions, big questions, is there such a thing as individuality? And I'll get into that shortly. And then why do we treat disease the way we do? And what might the future of medicine look like? The future may be actually a lot quicker. We're not talking 10, 20, 100 years from now. Um, we might see a big revolution here, and hopefully we will very quickly. So individuality. So the date, July 20th, 1969, imagine it sticks in everyone's mind. Something monumental happened in world history. And can anyone tell me what happened on July 20th, 1969? Anybody? Neil Armstrong. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. Actually, that's only partially true. What happened on those day, on that day, is we had ecosystems landing on the moon of 200 trillion microbes surrounded by two brains that self-identified themselves as Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. These encapsulated in those space suits are actually ecosystems. This is very important. We tend to think of ourselves as individuals, but we're actually walking ecosystems. And it's very important for our health. So what's living inside us is actually 10 times more microbial cells than actual cells in our body. And 100 times more, gene, more, more genes, more genetic material is devoted to microbes in our bodies. Each of us sitting here, we are, the minority of our body is what we think of ourselves as human. We're mostly microbes. That's a very profound statement. And I really want to change people's thinking about what constitutes an individual. So these are bacteria, fungi, archaea, even um, um, uh, protozoans, worms, all sorts of organisms that are living as ecosystems. Usually it's very stable, but they're living inside us and on us. And this ecosystem uh, is host dependent and also dependent upon where it is in your body. So different places on your skin, your arm is going to be, have a different uh, microbiota than your intestine or your mouth. It, we, are, we are very complex ecosystems, just as complex as an Amazonian rainforest. But there has been error, and it, it's, it's hard to blame uh, the history of science, how this came about, but we've always looked at individual organisms as being individual organisms. So go back to the history of science, and they started looking at anatomy, what did they do? They, they looked at an individual person and started dissecting and getting the anatomy of that person. It made this mindset that there are individuals. When we started doing animal experiments, what do we do? We look at rodents, individual rodents, not as communities of rodents and not as rodents that actually are ecosystems themselves. Look at the history of, of medicine in terms of how we treat disease. It's always been, there's always been a pathogen, a single pathogen that's caused the problem, isolate those, that pathogen and find something that will kill it. Right, so uh, Cook's postulates um, demonstrating that a potential or a particular um, pathogen is the cause of disease 
And then we develop some sort of antibiotic that will kill that pathogen. Single cause, single disease. And it was very successful and very important because there were a lot of really terrible diseases that a lot of people died from. And the idea of using antibiotics saved a lot of lives. It's very important. But now we've gotten to the point where that we understand that we're also um, living ecosystems, but also that we've really overused antibiotics and this idea of single pathogens. Um, I'm sure most people who went to medical school, what did you learn? That, that all the bad bugs, right, in the, in the textbooks. So the list of all the bad things, not thinking about all of the good things, the good things that are living inside us and around us that, that actually help us. So what have we done as a consequence? Well, we've become a society of germaphobes. So we try to kill every germ because we assume, both as public and maybe as clinicians, that, that germs are bad. And so um, fortunately, triclosan and, um, and our soaps has uh, finally been banned, that um, killing everything non-specifically, not really a good idea. Um, overuse of antibiotics, which everyone is uh, concerned about now. But particularly disturbing is the use of antibiotics in livestock. And the only rationale for using antibiotics in livestock usually, you now sometimes they develop infections and a veterinarian has to actually treat that infection. But what they had found, I believe in the 1960s, was that if you actually give low levels of antibiotics to livestock, then they grow faster and they grow bigger with less food. So it's purely economics. There's no, nothing about the animal's health, it's economics. And so you have these low levels of antibiotics in our livestock that help promote antibiotic resistance. Now, one of the things that we've always thought about is antibiotic resistance um, is a new, new phenomenon and it actually caused, it's caused by humans. Well, the truth is, antibiotic resistance has been around for at least two billion years. And I've uh, actually done some cave exploring, and I've talked to uh, scientists who do cave microbiology. And it sounds kind of weird, but it's actually very important. Because what they've done, so this cave is 100 in New Mexico, 120 miles long, it takes eight days to get into the far reaches of that cave, and they take microbial samples out of that. So it's a monumental undertaking. What they found is these microbes, these bacteria that have been living there for millions of years without any human contact, in fact, they predate humans. When they analyze them, they have antibiotic resistance genes in them already. So where do they come from? What they found is, in these stressful environments, because in dark, inside a dark cave, there's very little energy. They actually eat rock, essentially, for their energy. So there's a lot of competition between these microbes. And what they do is they've established over millions of years this, this war. They start producing antibiotics, and then the, their enemy produces a resistance to those antibiotics. So there's two things that we learn from microbes in caves. One is the fact that there are um, antibiotic resistance genes, but there are also potential new sources of antibiotics that we, that we can discover and then use to uh, create new antibiotics. So it's a very exciting area that um, probably not, not many people think about. So how do we know about this, the microbiota now in our bodies? Well, this is really a technological revolution. And so uh, prior to the last 10, 15 years, the way you studied microbiology is you took a swab of something and you put it on a culture plate and you had to culture it. And we know that uh, something like 85% of known microbes or bacteria can't even be cultured. So if you can't culture it, you can't grow it, you can't study it. Well, now we have next generation sequencing. We can sequence very inexpensively these genomes from these microbes. So now we can start making catalogs, which they've done in the Human um, uh, Microbiome Project. We have these catalogs now of 
the, the microbes that we find in all different areas, but also on the human body. So it's an astounding leap forward in our knowledge. So we now know just the, the sheer breadth of the types of organisms that inhabit our bodies. So we know that the, um, the microbiota changes, or it's different, different between individuals. Every one of us is unique in terms of the, the number and types of microbes that are inhabiting our bodies. And also it changes depending on where uh, you sample on the body. And it changes over time, slowly. We also know that it's only a tiny, tiny proportion of microbes that actually cause disease. Most of them are harmless. Some of them actually help us. So they actually produce uh, some B vitamins, uh, vitamin K2. They help digest uh, food for us. So the change in paradigm now is thinking of this microbiome, or microbiota in our body, really as a separate organ. It's just as important as liver, spleen, brain. It, we have to start thinking about it as a living organ that's part of our body that's essential to us. We also know that the way the microbiota develops, develops between the um, first, uh, second, and third year of life. And we get most of our microbiota from our mothers. And it's also important um, there's a difference between people, um, uh, babies who are born vaginally versus C-section. It's a huge difference. So, um, and the children that are born through C-section, they found that there are higher rates of lots of, of diseases. Um, um, insulin resistance, um, obesity, uh, pretty much down the list of, of our chronic uh, diseases that uh, we're concerned about today. There are, higher, there are higher incidents of that for children who are born C-section versus vaginally. For millions of years, through human um, evolution, children have always been born vaginally. The mother inoculates the child with her microbiome and gets that started, this healthy microbiome. Same with breastfeeding. All of the things that have been part of normal um, uh, nurturing in human culture has, even though we don't see it because it's microscopic, it has a profound effect on health because it's nurturing a healthy microbiome for the human body. Something really astounding, and I think this is something that's very, very important, is when they've sampled the microbiota from different people from different societies around the world, they found, so if you go to the uh, Yamanami in um, Venezuela, they have tremendously diverse microbiota. They also have fewer chronic diseases that we have today in Western society. I mean, they do have mortality, but it's from um, accidents, snake bites, spites, things like that, but they don't have heart disease and cancer and things like that that we have. Certainly um, not the high rates of obesity and, and, um, and heart disease. In contrast, in Western society, we have less than half the diversity of microbes. And you can, you can see this as we go from culture to culture. So cultures that have been pretty much isolated from Western society have very diverse microbiota. And the question is, oh, I'll back up a second. So we also see that the obesity rates, as everyone knows, is rising in the United States. And it's been rising the past 50 years. Um, if you actually superimpose this map of obesity rates, um, it also correlates very well with the use of antibiotics in the United States. So, so we know that um, the microbes that inhabit our body, on the positive side, it helps promote immunity, um, it's important for our metabolism, and produces vitamins for us. So it actually digests a lot of um, the food for us, gives us um, these important nutrients. When we have dysregulation of our microbiota, then we're more uh, predisposed to obesity, inflammation, diabetes, cancers, even um, um, neurological and psychological issues like autism, depression, anxiety. If linked with a lack of diversity in microbiota with even um, psychiatric conditions, which is pretty profound. 
one of, so, so what do you do about this? Well, um, the thing that, the first thing that's actually had a lot of success is with Clostridium difficile. So as we know, is, it could be a very serious condition. And it usually follows um, a stringent course of antibiotics. And so the problem with these antibiotics is they tend to be very broad. Even, even um, uh, small spectrum antibiotics kill a lot of things besides the pathogen. So when you wipe out someone's microbiota, then what that allows is things like C. diff to start blooming and growing. And so what we've found is that a healthy microbiota actually helps keep pathogens at bay. Because all of us have pathogens living in us right now. If we, probably all of us actually have uh, staph living in us, but we don't have staph infections. But why is that? Because we have these healthy ecosystems of microbes that keep everything in check. And so there's this healthy balance. It's only when you disturb that, that balance is when the pathogen gets out of control and it starts growing and causes disease. So one of the big success stories, and I think this is just this is just the, the tip of the iceberg, it's going to really revolutionize medicine with C. diff infections, what they found is if you can actually take microbiota from a healthy individual and put it into the patient, they've had something like a 95% uh, success rate in curing C. diff infections. So, unfortunately, the name that they call it is a, a fecal transplant. Um, they, they could probably do a lot better if they changed the name of uh, that. But it does demonstrate the fact that having a healthy microbiota and being able to transfer that to individuals is going to be um, part of the future of medicine. It's really restoring our microbes. And you say, well, what about the probiotics and prebiotics? that we have now. So we have probiotics, right, in yogurt. Well, the problem is we're missing, all of us in Western society, we're missing hundreds of species of microbes. So you're not going to get that through your yogurt. The other thing is it's not persistent. So you've got to eat that yogurt every day. So the challenge is how do we get persistent uh, diversity of microbes back into our bodies? And that's an open question. We don't know how to do that quite yet. And so, the one thing I want to leave everybody with is a change in thinking. Instead of thinking of treating an individual, this is a person, this is an individual person, um, isolated, that we need to start thinking about treating the person as an ecosystem and helping that ecosystem be balanced and healthy. And it might be, in going to jo Joseph in terms of the um, the diet, what they found is healthy microbiota is helped by a high fiber diet. So everything that he had said in terms of the kinds of things that you eat in your diet help promote healthy microbiota. And so healthy microbiota on a, on a broad scale, um, large scale, there's, there's two phyla. Um, there's Formicides and Bacteriotides. And so what you'd like is a lot of Bacteriotides and less Formicides. Well, Formicides actually thrives on fats, it uh, thrives on carbohydrates, everything in our Western diet, it thrives on. And so that's what they see in the imbalance, and that's what starts um, being correlated with a lot of these chronic diseases. So how do you tip that balance is going to be the question. So with probiotic, or a, a prebiotic diet, a lot of fibers, a lot of fruits and vegetables, things like that, natural foods, that helps support a healthy microbiota. The question is, how do you reintroduce that, those healthy microbes? What are the healthy microbes? How do you reintroduce them into the body? So again, thinking of us not as individuals, but as ecosystems, but also as ecosystems, we're all interacting with each other. So I'm sure Many of us shook hands this morning. Well, you've got to think about the fact that every time, everywhere we go, we're around other people, we are actually exchanging genetic material. We're exchanging DNA, we're exchanging viruses, bacteria. We are all connected. 
And I think that's really important to understand. Even when you go into any area, you're breathing in dust, and this dust has bacteria and microbes in it. So this idea of thinking of an individual as a sterile individual is wrong. We need to start thinking of ourselves as ecosystems and ecosystems that are interacting with everything and everybody around us. And so it's, it's a different way of thinking, but I think that's really going to help the practice of medicine in the future. So really in summary, I think it's important to recognize that this self-boundary that we think of is really an imaginary construct. It's what our brain constructs, that, that we're individuals. We're not individuals, we're ecosystems. Where would we go? If you land on the moon, whoever lands on Mars, it's not a person landing on Mars, it's an ecosystem. Just thinking in those terms. And recognize the benefits of a healthy hum human microbiome. So anytime you prescribe antibiotics, okay, to realize the downside of that, that you're wiping out the pathogen, you may need to do that to save the patient, and it's very important, but also recognize that you're going to be wiping out a lot of, you're going to be causing collateral damage, wiping out a lot of healthy microbes as well. So recognizing that. And then recognizing the risk of intentionally or unintentionally upsetting our internal ecosystems. So there's a lot of things that we can be doing that could be unintentionally upsetting those, um, this internal ecosystem. So one is the, use, the overuse of even um, of um, cleaning materials. So all this, the bleaching everything, being a germaphobe, cleaning all of the surfaces. You know, in some senses, that, that's actually important. So if you're uh, preparing chicken, right, raw chicken, you actually want to clean those surfaces because we know we don't want to get salmonella or listeria. On the other hand, going overboard and excessively cleaning everything and especially for young children, as children are growing up, we all know that they need to be exposed to, to, to more bacteria. So, so having a healthy balance of, and recognizing what you're doing whenever you're killing germs, that of all the pathogens you're killing, you're also probably killing beneficial or at least harmless microbes as well. And again, just treating a person as an ecosystem and just thinking in those terms of you're not treating an individual person, we're not lab rats, we're not isolated selves, we are actually ecosystems. And it's a whole change in paradigm, it's hard to think about, but once you get in the habit, it's really pretty profound. So that's really the message that I have for you today. So, if, um, thanks, and I guess we'll have a question and answer. Yeah, thank you, Dan, please stand in to go. Uh, two terrific presentations.